This is the Asus ROG Strix Z890i Gaming Wi-Fi. It's an Intel-based processor. This is actually a really interesting firecracker of a motherboard, but I've discovered something interesting with the Core Ultra 285. Not the K, not the K. The non-K Core Ultra 285, which was kind of a stealth launch, a weird stealth launch. So I've put together a test system based around this motherboard, but first let's go on a tour of this motherboard and then let me tell you what I found. So if you've not been following since the new Core Ultra Series 2 launch at the end of 2024, Intel said that the performance was pretty good, but reviewers didn't find the performance to be quite as good as what Intel was saying. And they said, oh, this is down to operating system updates, BIOS updates, management engine. We're gonna work on that. And they have, and that is kind of in this and kind of in the updates that we have here. But the performance might actually be in the Core Ultra non-K because this platform with this tiny little unassuming CPU is actually very impressive computationally, especially when we take efficiency into account. But first, let's take a look at the platform because there's a lot here that I like and there's a couple things that I don't like. So the ROG Strix Z890i Gaming Wi-Fi is from Asus. It's kind of one of the high-end products from Asus. They really put a lot of thought and engineering into this. This is an ITX board. It is designed for small form factor builds and yet it's pretty overclockable in terms of power delivery. You can still get those Core Ultra 9 super clocks in it the K with the overclocking, but I think this is actually a much more interesting platform for the non-K CPUs based on the testing that I've been able to do so far. So this motherboard in the box, what do you get? Well, you get the motherboard itself. That's interesting. But then you also get this little hockey puck thing. This is the ROG Strix Hive 2. Yeah, the Hive 2. This is a really neat USB-C accessory because it gives you USB breakout, of course. It's got some LEDs on it that are multi-use that I'll talk about in a second. You've got your hardware power button, and then you've got a programmable flex key. So you could hit this and go into the BIOS and that sort of stuff. There's also a volume control that works for controlling the volume on your machine, as well as a 3.5 millimeter combination headphone microphone jack. There's also a built-in Wi-Fi 7 solution, which comes with a really nice Q connector Wi-Fi antenna. That's uh, Asus's sort of quick release Wi-Fi antenna. You don't have to thread it on there. It just pops on and off, so it's easy to add and remove that. This thing also has uh, built-in cooling fans for the VRM and the M.2. So if we take a look at the board layout here, we've got two full-size DDR5 DIMM slots. That's for up to 96 gigabytes of memory, non-ECC, and clocked unbuffered DIMMs, CU DIMMs. Now, the box is already out of date. It says 96 gigs on the box, but Asus was first to support 64 gigabyte DIMMs from Kingston. So this platform will actually support 128 gigabytes. We've got a separate video on that with the Asus ProArt. You should check that out. First motherboard to support 256 gigabytes because that's a desktop board. It's got four slots and they actually improved the clocks because it's usually really hard to use four DDR5 DIMMs with a you know a desktop class motherboard, two DIMMs per channel, but you actually can check out that video. On this platform, 96 gigabytes, pretty easy to do, 128 gigabytes if you get the right combination of DIMMs. This may need a BIOS update to get maximum compatibility because that's what we needed on the desktop boards, but that's not something that I saw in looking at this just yet. Now check out our M.2 tower here. This thing is fascinating. It's got an extra fan mount, you gotta pop out two screws, and then this whole thing removes as a unit. It's got this latch that you pop loose and then the whole thing sort of folds like a butterfly. I don't know how else to describe this. There's two M.2 here. There's a primary M.2 that goes directly to the CPU. The other M.2 also goes directly to the CPU, but it shares lanes with the X16 slot, which means if you use the second M.2 slot here, it will actually cause your GPU to drop down to eight lanes from 16. I don't agree with this design decision. This is one of the, one of the, things about this board that I don't like. If they had gone with an M.2 through the chipset, it would have been limited to PCIe 4.0 speeds. But with the advent of new high-end graphics cards giving us 16 PCIe Gen 5 lanes, I'm not sure that I agree with this. As I've got it set up in my test bench though, I've got the Intel Arc. That's only eight lanes. There is no downside for using this kind of a GPU in this platform and be able to use both of your M.2 at PCIe Gen 5 speeds. So it's important to get the primary M.2 to be the one where you stick your M.2 and you can see that on the manual that's marked with the brown number two here. It doesn't really go out of its way to explain that that's what's happening. I actually had to go to Asus's website and download the manual to unpack what was happening here. So. 
I, I really would have liked if that second M.2 on the carrier card were through the chipset, even though that means that it wouldn't be PCIe Gen 5. I think that's probably okay. In terms of other stuff that's laid out on the motherboard, there are some analog temperature sensor headers just behind this breakout card, which they call the FPS card. We'll come back to that. Your USB type C header, your 20 pin, five gigabit header. You get three four pin fan headers at the top edge of the board, your single eight pin CPU power input. You get two addressable RGB headers there and a fourth four pin fan header right there for you know your chassis or whatever you want to use. You can also use that for your M.2 fan because there is an accessory kit that will add a second M.2 fan. Now if you look closely at the motherboard, there is actually a primary M.2 fan, a fan set up just for the M.2. And I love that because I set up our system here with the Crucial T705. This is one of the fastest PCIe Gen 5 SSDs that you can get. I've been plugging these for a long time in a lot of builds and it's very hard to get the Crucial T705. I think it sold a little better than they were expecting or possibly the bottom fell out of the flash memory uh, market or something, I, I don't know. But the T705 is a fantastic storage device. Let's take a quick look at the rear I.O. You've got two USB 2.0 ports, HDMI out from the integrated GPU, two and a half gig NIC, then you've got your 10 gig USB Thunderbolt 4 port, and then just over from that, you got another Thunderbolt 4 port, and then we got three USB 5 gig port. Over from that, we've got two Type A 10 gig ports, then we got our BIOS flashback port, which is also a USB 10 gig port, and then we've got a 20 gigabit, that's two by 10, just below that for our hockey puck control thingy, the Strix Hive 2. And then we have a BIOS flashback button just below our M.2 fan. Now let's talk about this FPS card. This is a breakout card. It gives you two USB 2 headers, your front panel connection. There's a mechanical switch there, which does some interesting stuff. You get two six gigabit per second SATA ports and that other ARGB header. I knew there was a third one there somewhere. Now, hilariously, mine was in the USB support drive box, which in these ITX boards from, you know, Asus, I'm used to having a USB stick. This didn't actually come with a USB stick the way that some of the other ROG motherboards did, but the breakout board was in there because the motherboard by itself doesn't have the thing and then it slides onto these two USB-C looking connectors and they're not USB-C, not even remotely, not even a little bit, but that's where the breakout header goes for this thing. So you can connect it and that works. And that's, that's a fun, interesting thing. Now this mechanical switch, this is Asus thinking outside the box and I love it. It changes the PCIe mode of the PCIe slot. So it's on auto by default, which you'll try to auto negotiate. If you slide it to the middle setting, it'll set it to PCIe Gen 4. If you slide it to the end, it'll be PCIe Gen 3. Could be a great way to play a prank on your friend, but really they're thinking about people that have PCIe extension cables and things like that. So this extension cable is supposed to be PCIe Gen 4 compatible, but it's a little sketchy just a little bit sketchy at PCIe Gen 4 speeds. So if you're troubleshooting weird intermittent crashing and you have an extension cable like this, sometimes these are fine for forever and then they're not. And everything is fine with your computer stability until it's not. A lot of the time you can claw back some of that stability if you change the modes. Now there's a couple on the market right now that are PCIe Gen 5 compatible, but mostly they are not PCIe Gen 5 compatible. So if you change the switch to PCIe Gen 4 mode, the system will post. These CPUs have a built-in iGPU generally, unless you get a version that doesn't have a built-in iGPU. And yes, you could boot with no GPU installed, go into the BIOS and set the mode in the BIOS. But it is so much easier and faster to just set the mode via switch. I think some system integrators and some system builders probably would like the fact that there's a switch, they can just set the switch, they don't have to fiddle with BIOS and then they're good to go, especially if they're doing builds that involve these extension cables. But with an ITX build, if you can do an ITX build without an extension, especially if you're going to do one of the highest end GPUs, uh, yeah, it, you should not have an extension because your life will just be, it's just a source of headache, potentially. And if you want maximum stability, you want to avoid things like that. But it's pretty cool that it has a switch that's useful diagnostically. So I like that. Now, let's get our BIOS updated and go on a quick tour of the BIOS because we need to talk about the Core Ultra because we need to talk about the Core Ultra 285, not K. Now, as with all new computers, no matter what you get, updating the BIOS as soon as you get your system put together is important for better system stability, compatibility, better performance, you name it. And Intel, this generation, is a little weird. It's, it's not just the BIOS that you have to update. There's a separate thing called the Intel Management Engine that you also have to update. And you don't seem to be able to update the Management Engine through the BIOS. There's some language in ASUS's BIOS that suggests that it can like read a zip file and update the Management Engine, but I haven't found this to actually work correctly on systems that I've put together yet. But you can update the BIOS and then you'll get a warning from the BIOS saying, hey, the Management Engine is out of date. On the first page, 
of the advanced section of the BIOS, it'll actually show the management engine version. But I usually just let this warning time out for 60 seconds and then update the management engine actually from the operating system. So if you're setting up your computer initially and you're gonna be on Windows, you'll have to install Windows from USB first and deal with that 60 second countdown a couple of times as the machine reboots to get you installed. And then once you're installed, you run the management engine update. And the first time you run the management engine update, it says, oh, the driver isn't installed. And if you install the driver from Asus's website, it also still says the driver isn't installed. You have to download the driver from Intel's website and a bunch of other chipset. You can also use uh, Asus's Armory, Armory Crate software, and that will automatically install a bunch of things. But Asus had a thing recently where they deployed a Christmas update, and it freaked everybody out because Christmas.exe is also the name of malware. And uh, a little bit of a faux pas, a little bit of a like, wait a minute, why can Asus just randomly install crap on my computer without telling me? And it just randomly happened. Armory Crate. You can disable that in the BIOS too. There's a BIOS option for that. Out of the box, PCIe ASPM is disabled, which is to do with M.2 compatibility, but hey, it works fine. And speaking of M.2 compatibility, we can see that our T705 here on the info screen is being kept adequately cool by the butterfly wedge M.2 thingy that we're dealing with, mainly because it's got active cooling. Of course, if you have an M.2 that has a built-in heatsink, that could be a little problematic to use with this setup. There, there are some crucial T705s that come with a heatsink pre-installed. Uh, you shouldn't get those for this because it's hard to remove the M.2 from the heatsink. So I think Crucial made a little bit of a faux pas there. They should have made it easy to remove the heatsink so that people could buy either SKU, but they didn't. So I'm letting you know that it's more of a pain in the butt to remove that heat sink from the M.2 than you realize, but just, just so you know. Asus's other options here is basically everything you'd expect. Full support for XMP profiles, overclocking, voltage, tweaking, basically anything you could want to do. As I've got DDR5 8200 CU DIMM running on this platform pretty stable, I did have a lot of fun messing around with that, trying to squeeze just a little bit more performance out of the Core Ultra 285 non-K for gaming reasons. Uh, be sure to look for that in, in, the, in the next video in the series when we get the system put together in our Falcon Northwest Tiki system. But yeah, the, the BIOS has basically everything that you'd want. Oh, and if you've got a GPU that'll let you run uh, X8, X4, X4, you can totally do that. Just remember that you're not gonna be able to use that second M.2 slot on the M.2 carrier because you've only got 16 plus four PCIe Gen 5 lanes and Asus does not seem to have routed the other chipset PCIe lanes to anywhere that you can get at them on this board. All in all, I was happy to see the BIOS as full featured as it is, and because this is an Intel NIC, you also can boot from the network, if that's important for your build or whatever you're working on. So this is the Intel reference cooler, and it's doing a perfectly reasonable job cooling this CPU, Core Ultra 285 not K. So these CPUs are actually capable of really pretty incredible power efficiency but the K-series CPUs just aren't there. But if you look at our Geekbench scores, our Cinebench scores, and even our gaming scores, baseline, we'll come back to the gaming in just a second, this thing holds its own. It is very, very close to the performance of a Core Ultra 285K. Now Intel, for their part, they didn't really price these a lot less expensive than the K, so like K versus not K. If you're doing a system build and you're going for something elaborate, maybe it makes more economic sense to just go ahead and get the K CPU because it's only a little bit more expensive. But if Intel had priced these a little more aggressively and you're not interested in overclocking, then you could save money getting the non-K CPU. If you're doing a small form factor build, it could also make sense because you don't have the temptation and the heat output and everything else of a K series CPU. These will behave in a much more conservative power envelope out of the box. There's no danger of having something misconfigured and it actually using more power. The Core Ultra 9 for productivity tasks, coding, programming, you know, higher end productivity is very, very impressive. It holds its own and it is a, an upgrade over the i9-14900K. Unfortunately for Intel, for gaming workloads, right now, AMD is the leader. And actually because of the updates to Windows, the Windows operating system and software updates and everything else to be able to use uh, everything a little bit better, a lot of the 7000 series AMD CPUs have edged ahead of the 14th gen Intel CPUs, which is, you know, there, there's a lot of Intel fans out there that, you know, it's like, no, that's that's a sarcosanct. That's, that's settled. Those are settled arguments. And, and yet the software has uh, propelled us a little forward. There have been a lot of software updates for the Core Ultra Series 2 platform, Core Ultra 9 285K, since it launched 
late in 2024, here we are in the first quarter of 2025, and a lot of those operating system updates and underlying software updates have benefited both AMD and Intel. And so I'm not sure that Intel has found the performance holy grail that they're looking for, but at the same time, this not being a K-series CPU performing as well as it is, is very, very impressive. I just wish that Intel had priced it a little more aggressively because we could still have the, the K-series CPUs that are priced for what they are, but then it would have been an opportunity to have like a discount option where the non-K-series CPUs are a little cheaper. But this is still a ridiculous amount of compute horsepower for the price that it is in the market. So it's impressive in its own right. Now, this motherboard is also the same motherboard that Falcon Northwest uses in their Tiki configuration. And so my plan is to do higher-end GPU testing in a Falcon Northwest Tiki system to explore this software thing a little bit more because, well, it's the, the non-K CPU is doing better historically than the non-K CPUs have from Intel in terms of like percentage performance. I mean, I was really impressed by like the 12700 and the 12900. We did some videos on building small form factor machines or getting bare bones kits and then throwing in those. We've even done some crazy stuff with like the 13700T and the 13900T. Those are even lower wattage CPUs that perform exceptionally well. And this, this doesn't seem to be any different in terms of power efficiency. It's even more power efficient. So for small form factor builds, it could be really interesting. So we're gonna do a video based on a Falcon Northwest build with this exact motherboard and see how it stacks up with the highest end gaming GPU potential, basically versus the 9800X 3D. So stay tuned for that. But this, this has been a quick tour of the ROG Strix Z890i gaming Wi-Fi, this motherboard and what it offers. And it's got some pretty cool accessories and overall holds its own. Now, if you do wanna get a K-series CPU for this, it will do it, you can overclock it, everything's great, but you're gonna need a lot more cooling than the Intel reference cooler, a lot more, probably an AIO. Probably you wanna look at like maybe the Arctic Freezer, Arctic Freezer 3, that's a good choice, L, you know, LGA 1700 mounting style, even though this is 18, uh, different socket, 1851, whatever, it's fine, it's completely fine, this is a good build. I'm gonna sign out and see you later. But that's enough rambling for now. If you have any questions or you wanna see something specific for that build or let me know what your workload is, Hit me up in the comments below. I'll see you in the forums at level one. I'm signing out and I'll see you there.